The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. There's a powerful scene at the very end of the 2021 sci-fi satire film, Don't Look Up. This is a movie about scientists who are trying to warn everyone else about this literal meteor that is about to hit Earth. The movie itself is hilarious um, in like a you have to laugh or else you're just going to cry kind of way. It pokes fun at our 24-hour news cycle, at misinformation, corporate greed, clueless politicians, and more. No matter what the facts in front of their faces show, people simply aren't willing to believe that a meteor is coming for them, even when they can see it directly overhead. And so at the end of the movie, the main characters and their loved ones gather together at home for dinner. They come together around a kitchen table. They turn off the news. They tell stories about mundane things. They reminisce. At one point, they all hold hands, and they wonder if, like, maybe should we pray? But nobody really knows how to. And then there's one sole religious person among them, and he finally prays. And he asks for grace. He asks for forgiveness, and most of all, he asks for God's love and care to soothe them and to give them courage through all the difficulties that may lie ahead. And then the talk turns to apple pie and whether or not store-bought or homemade is better. And this scene as it unfolds is overlaid with this montage of images of what's happening out there in the rest of the world. The meteor is entering the atmosphere, it's crashing. People are running. Babies are being born and taking baths in kitchen sinks. Children are laughing. Couples are kissing. Animals are panicking. But around this kitchen table, it could kind of be any other day. They're sitting there and they are talking about apple pie and coffee. And they're holding hands and the coffee cups on the table start shaking. And finally, you see the walls begin to peel away. As Joy Harjo writes, perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying and eating of the last sweet bite. It's no accident that so many of our sacred stories are about eating and gathering around tables. Harjo says, no matter what, we must eat to live. Jesus' first miracle is water into wine at a wedding party. And later, of course, we all know about the loaves and the fishes. Elijah asks the widow to make him a bit of bread with her meager ration of flour and oil. The lovers in the Song of Songs sing about pomegranates and milk and honey. There are parables in our sacred texts about fig trees and the giant party that is thrown for the prodigal son when he returns home. The leaders in the early church fretted and argued about how to sit down at tables together when some of them followed more restrictive dietary laws than the others. And Jesus cooks up a breakfast of fish on the lakeshore after the resurrection. And of course, we all still remember that final meal that he shared with his disciples every time that we gather here at the table for communion. Even the prayer that Jesus taught his followers and that we still say week after week reminds us that we all have to eat to live. Give us this day our daily bread. Now the Israelites didn't have tables to gather around when they were wandering in the wilderness. They had left their tables behind, and their grain, and their yeast, and their bowls, and their ovens. They just dropped it all and left home, striking out in hope of a better future. They were told that they were headed to the land of milk and honey. They were told that things would be better on the other side. They were told that all they needed to do was believe, hope, and follow, and that they'd finally be free. Imagine their surprise when it turns out that the promised land wasn't just right next door. 
I was talking with a friend of mine, a pastor friend, Leah, earlier this week, and she made the observation that there's really no reason they should have been wandering in the desert for 40 years. Like, I don't know if you've ever looked at a map, but they should have been able to make that journey a little bit faster. But if there's one thing that we know about humans, it's that we are not always able to do things the way that we're supposed to. We mess up. We disappoint. We wander in circles, making the same mistakes and getting lost in the same way. We fail. We fall short. And we manage to do this over and over and over again. And in all of that wandering, the words still ring true. No matter what, we must eat to live. And so the people of God found themselves in the wilderness without a table to gather around, no chairs to pull up, no teacups to warm their hands, no pitches of water to share, no bread fresh out of the oven, just nothing. They found themselves depleted, lost, exhausted, despondent. And the story goes that God showed up. Quail in the evening, manna in the morning, and bellies were filled. Needs were met. Stories were shared. Perhaps you'd maybe even like to imagine families gathering around a big boulder here or there, makeshift tables in the wilderness. On Wednesday morning of this past week, manna showed up here at the church. I came down at 8 o'clock in the morning to turn on the lights in case anybody needed to stop in for a hug or a prayer on their way to work. As I left the house that morning, I grabbed a box of brownie mix from my pantry because, I don't know, it just seemed like the kind of days where brownies might be useful. And I turned on the oven in the kitchen and I suddenly realized, I can't make these brownies. I didn't bring an egg. And I couldn't run out to the store because I wanted to be here at the church in case anybody stopped by, so I was just out of luck. There's nothing worse than a box of brownies you can't cook. <laughs> Before 9 o'clock, Linda showed up. We shared a big hug, and she told me that she had come to put the coffee on. And before long, Linda was doing as Linda does, bustling around the kitchen. Coffee, tea, snacks, all lovingly set out for anybody who might need them that day. And then a little while later, Jackie showed up with the groceries for second helping, and Linda and I visited with her as she brought them in and put them away. We all noted that it was good to have something tangible to do while we were in the wilderness. Groceries still needed to be brought in. Volunteer slots still need to be filled. People still need to eat to live. Also, it turns out that there were extra eggs in the second helping grocery order, and Linda assured me that I could have one to make the brownies. And then at one point, I heard the voice of a man that was unfamiliar to me, and I heard Sandy talking to him and sharing information about common table meals, and then I heard them walking out to the blessing box to see what else they could find out there for him. Before long, the kitchen smelled like chocolate, and then Janet showed up with an armful of carbs. She came in and said, I brought carbs from Parkside, <laughs> and it all went onto the table. Coffee, tea, water, fruit, brownies, croissants, more. It was really more than anyone needed. Um, but that table anchored the day. And people continued to wander in and out all day long. They wandered in numb, confused, sad, angry, surprised, unsure. And the kitchen table stood steady. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. People are hungry today. They were hungry a week ago, and they'll be hungry next week, too. And sometimes that hunger is physical. It's a craving for something that tastes good, like brownies. It's a basic alarm bell in our rumbling tummies reminding us that we need to stop and eat. Or it's the deeper hunger when we don't have access to the food that we need. Sometimes that hunger is emotional. We need to be held, soothed, heard, understood, seen. Sometimes that hunger is spiritual. We need to know that we're not alone in the wilderness, that something exists beyond what we can see in front of our own faces, that we don't live our lives in vain. But no matter what, 
We must eat to live. And so we keep gathering around kitchen tables. We sit with family, friends, and strangers too. We pass the plates and refill the glasses and we make sure that everyone has what they need. When we notice people lingering around the edges, we scoot over and we pull up a chair for them and we make new friends and we retell the stories that we heard from our ancestors and we pray and we tell jokes and we compliment the chef and we ask if we can help with the dishes. And it's quail in the evening and manna in the morning. And we say that we don't quite understand how the spirit makes it happen. Except we do understand a little, don't we? We show up and we make the coffee. We bring carbs to share. We walk each other to the blessing box and we show up with groceries for second helping. We open our arms and our hearts to receive one another, keeping a special eye out for those who have been pushed to the side. We remind each other that there's no need to hoard, that there's actually already enough here for everyone if we can just remember to share. It took our ancestors a lot longer than it should have to reach the promised land. And some of them never made it. Time and time again, they disappointed one another. They had to stop to lick their wounds. There were shouting matches and tears. They argued about the best way to get there. They failed to learn from their mistakes. They lost hope. And then they found it again. They carried the sick and tired when their feet gave out, and they took turns chasing the children and carrying the babies. And they wandered in circles, and they found themselves back at the beginning, and they cried tears of frustration. And they kept gathering around tables, because the world begins and ends and begins and ends and begins at the kitchen table. Beloveds, it is my prayer for you that in all our many beginnings and endings and everything in between, you will continue to find the sustenance that you need and that you will keep showing up at tables to share what you have, especially with those who need it the most. May it be so.